So that is gold. Uh, so the pub the, saved your life. The pub, yeah. It's uh, look, it's it's done a lot of things in negatively to me at times. <laughs> the pub, but you know, it's uh, you know, you earned some credits on that day. That is amazing. But I mean, the, what you have to go through mentally when you're in that space, it's uh, you switch into a different mode. Like on that. Um, uh, when, when I'd left to, to walk and try and outrun this fire, by the second day I'd got my rifle, I'd, I'd filled up the uh, the magazine and I had an extra five bullets in my pocket because I'm like, this fire comes through. You're going to shoot it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shoot all the camels and me. Like, I'm not, I'm not burning alive. We're, I'm not fucking putting us all through that. Fuck. So you mentally, and, and uh, what, what uh, I suppose uh, shocked me after is like how casually I did that. Welcome to the Sebo Show, guys. We have uh, a guest by the name of... John, camel man, Elliot, That's the, one. the great man, uh, someone I only met just last week and had no idea who he was. And then I saw him in this suit and hat, just like you can see here and was like, that guy does stuff and he does a lot of stuff, but, uh, I'll let him tell the story. It's a very interesting one. Please stick around cause the stories I've already heard that I'm going to get him to repeat are insane and it's something that's like better than a movie in my opinion i can't wait for the movie actually yeah thanks for being here man thank you for inviting me yeah, yeah it's good to meet you last week yeah started yeah. off a pretty interesting discussion there yeah um, oh bro man so how is everything firstly for you now that you're back before you reveal what you actually have done. Yeah, look, uh, it's a bit of an adjustment. Uh, like any any big change in life, like uh, any kind of change, it's uh, it's you always go through that that initial kind of adjustment period. But I, I kind of like being in that zone. I like forcing myself into that awkwardness. Um, so I'm enjoying the awkwardness of uh, adjusting back to city life. Live for the awkwardness. Yeah. And what do you do? Uh, well. Uh, some would argue not much, some would argue a whole lot. So uh, I, I suppose I semi-retired when I was 35, so had a whole lot of time on my hands. And uh, I previously worked in financial services, not the most uh, exciting of careers, some would say, in insurance, of all things. Um, I started up my first company when I was 25. I started up a company called Elliott Insurance Brokers. And um, yeah, that, that grew quite well it was, um, to the point where um, I no longer had to work in there day to day, uh, but I still was craving a bit of a challenge. So uh, I just had no idea where to direct that enthusiasm and energy. Um, and one night I was having a chat with a girlfriend of mine and there were about oh, four or five bottles of Red Deep, I reckon. Good. And uh, we're, we're talking about adventure or ch chasing an adventure. And uh, she mentioned this crazy story she had when she was 19 years old. Um, she was in Kenya and she entered a camel race. She's the only white person, only female in the race. It's a two-day race. It's not just one running down a stretch. It's a two-day race. She comes second. All right. So she wins enough money to fund her whole entire African trip all right, in this one race. So... Gets me thinking, I'm like, yeah, I want a bit of adventure. We, we've got a few camels here in Australia, I yeah. think. So uh, I said to her, I, I, I don't think I might do something with camels. And previously, I was thinking maybe with motorbikes, you know, doing the Ewan McGregor thing, you know, and just head off on a bike. Long way around. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. And then uh, now, mum said motorcycles are dangerous. So I called her up at like midnight, you know, five sheets to the wind and said, oh, mum, don't worry, I'm not taking a motor motorcycle. I'm going to take camels around Australia. And it was just... From that crazy moment, something switched and uh, I couldn't get the idea out of my head. The next day, I go into the office and I Google, how do you buy a camel? I had <laughs> no friggin' idea about what, any of this. I've never worked with animals or anything before. So, yeah, just uh, from that from that dinner, from, from that moment, Googling there, uh, one thing led to another and within two, three months, I had left my job as CEO of Elliott Insurance Brokers and I'd headed across over east to learn how to tame and train wild camels. So it all kind of clicked into place within about three months and, uh, and the adventure started. Far out, just, just like that. Just like that. So as much as uh, that, that, that's the tail end of it, I kind of knew that I wanted to um, leave and chase adventure about 12 months before. So I'd been gearing the business and, and getting ready to depart. I just had no idea what I was departing to do. So um, it... The idea and the concept came at the at the right kind of time. That's so, a that's an adventure in itself. Not it knowing it is not knowing. So uh, when when what year was this when you decided? It was two thousand eighteen. Yeah. 
So, um, or 2000 and back end of 2017, front end of 2018 is when I learned how to, started to learn how to train, yeah. train camels. And what's your background before, like growing up? Did you, did you like sports? Did you like the, the outback or did you like, did you go bush camping out in the bush and stuff? Oh man, I, I went bush the same way most Aussie blokes go bush with a bunch of blokes, a bunch of beers and a bit of bacon, pretend to catch food, uh, but unsuccessfully do it because you're too busy sinking cans and yeah. then you know, a, few, a few days later wind up back home and how it was a fishing trip I fucking didn't even throw a line in we ate it all yeah, yeah. yeah so, it was that good so that, that was my outback experience just grabbing a couple of boys and getting away so I hadn't really had a a real outback experience I never you know worked out there or done much I did spend a bit of time growing up just outside of the city in a place called Chittering Valley so I got a little bit of a taste for for what it's like uh, to be, have a bit of space around you. Yeah. Um, but no, I'd never really drunk the Kool-Aid as hard as I have <laughs> over the last five years. That was a, that was a big switch. So, you, so you're in Victoria and you start day one yep. of training camels. Yeah. What was the first day like? I, I, I dressed like this. <laughs> I, 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 I've got a picture. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass it through you so you can throw it up. But I literally came up. I think I was wearing this pocket square, actually. <laughs> so the guy who was trained us, Russell Osborne, he'd done a six and a half thousand kilometre trip around Australia. So I was On like, camels? Yeah, yeah. Jesus. So he'd done a big one. He, he um, uh, you know, I thought, you know, if you, if you want to learn how to play tennis, don't get a swimming coach, you know. Go, yeah. go to the guy who's actually done something like this before. So I, I did a course with him for about 10 days. Um, so I eventually lost the suit and, you know, slowly yeah. progressed into camel man mode. Uh, but um, I did 10 days with him there and then he flew over to Parabadu and we caught some wild camels and uh, trained some some actual wild camels as well. That was about another 10 days. So um, all up I had 20 days of training um, in camel handling um, and then a few months later I, I bought my first four. Yeah. Um, I ran around trying to catch some but uh, I had no fucking clue what I was doing. <laughs> so I was literally trying to round up wild camels with a drone you know, um, <laughs> so I ended up just busting the oil slump on my car and I got stranded out in the little sandy desert for three weeks straight uh, waiting for more oil to come out. So, um, yeah, that was a disaster. And it was just to catch the camels? Yeah, it was just to try and catch Far them. Far out. So uh, then uh, being so unsuccessful in there and sharing my journey on Facebook, um, someone reached out to us and said, hey, I've got a few extra camels we just caught out of the Simpson Desert um, over in Mill Merrin in Queensland near Toowoomba. And so I said, oh, yeah, all right, or maybe I'll, I'll go over to Queensland and get my camels from over there. But then the commitment was like, you know, it goes from being a WA desert adventure now to, fuck, that's all the way over in Queensland. I'm from WA. I guess I'm going to have to walk all the way back. So it took me about 24 hours to make the decision to say yes and uh, turn it from a 1,000-kilometre trip into a 4,500-kilometre trip. So that was the first big jump, I Jesus. suppose, from a small trip to a big trip. Um, <laughs> And uh, well, I, I was sucked in by the deal. It was buy three camels, get one free. So like, <laughs> but you five, have to walk back all the way to. Perth. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but, but the savings, <laughs> what a deal. the savings, oh, savings. Yeah. <laughs> what a what a bargain. Uh, most people go across the country to get a decent car to just drive it back. Yeah, but you got a free camel out of it. Yeah. And how long did it take you to come back? Uh, oh, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's it's fucking slow. So. Um, I, uh, I get these four camels and we're over in Mill Merrin. So, you know, here I am loaded up with me 20 days of training and all of a sudden I got these wild camels to start playing with. Uh, the guy uh, who I got the camels from, he let me stay in a caravan and work with the camels in the yards for a little while. Very quickly, he's like, this guy's got no fucking idea what he's doing. It was clear, <laughs> like, this guy does not know how to handle animals. I'm doing my best. I'm just taking my time to do it. Um, so uh, I eventually... I figure I need a little bit more of a hand, so I truck me and the camels from Mill Merrin to Gimpy to a camel dairy. So um, Camel dairy? A camel dairy, yeah. It's a growing thing that people are right into camel's milk. They, get like, they pay 15 bucks a litre for it. It's insane. Does it, like, taste better or different? Well, my, my camels were all males, so the milk was terrible. <laughs> So, but, no, but, but the female milk, which I think is the more marketable, popular one, they, uh, they're, uh, if you're lactose intolerant, you can generally have um, camel milk, it's lower in allergens, but yeah, I know everything's the new fucking superfood these days. Yeah, so, yeah, you yeah. know, they've all got their sales pitch, but um, it, by all accounts, there's, there's advantages to camel milk, that, yeah. uh, uh, especially if you've got allergies. Yeah. So I'm out there with this guy, um, Wayne Morrison, 
his wife Mel, and he's just really relaxed around camels. You know, he's going up there, slapping them on the ass. I find him asleep in the paddock with a few of the young ones. He's just, he taught me how to have a relationship with my camels, you know. So uh, I spent a few months there. And then I'm like, all right, we've got to actually get up to this start point. And I, I had no idea where I was going to start. So I'm looking at the map on the, I don't know I want to start on the coast in Queensland. And I see this place called Elliot Heads. I'm like, my surname's Elliot. <laughs> Fucking done. All right. So there's, that's the science that went into the start point. So I get up there and it takes me probably about three months to put the finishing touches on. I have to finish building all the saddles. Um, you know, you can get horse gear from horse land. There's no camel land. So everything you pretty much got to build or design from scratch. So I'm, no good at working with leather. I've never done anything before. I'm an insurance broker. You know, these hands hadn't seen too much hard work. So, <laughs> they're a bit uh, rough now. They're a bit <laughs> rougher now, mate. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I spent seven weeks in a saddlery shop learning how to work with leather so I could build all my own saddles. Far out. This just sounds like a, like a Skyrim quest. Every, every single time you, you, know, you make, make it to one level, you know, another two need to be unlocked. Yeah. It? Um, you know, if I was a tradie or I had a bush background, I would have brought something to the table. But I'm, I'm having to start from scratch because I just don't have any skill set or anything to bring to the table other than, you know, stubbornness and, you know, <laughs> I'm going to fucking do this. So we, uh, we build the saddles, we get them done, put the finishing touches on, and now it's time to get rid of the car and actually start this walk. That takes me two months. To get rid of the car? It will just <laughs> just to build, build up the courage. Oh, okay. As soon as that car's gone, there's no popping down the shops anymore. Yeah. Right? And I know with the way I am, as soon as I start, that, that that's it. You're, you're not stopping until this thing's done. So, All the way. Um, it's a good trait for a CEO. Yeah. 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 yeah you, so it, how many camels? It's hard to, to, to back things up. Yeah, you yeah, actually yeah, see it sure, through. So. Sure. so how many camels did you have when you four. pulled the trigger? So yeah. still four. Okay. So we've got these four. Did you name them? Yeah, yeah, so they've got names. So we started off with uh, Ted uh, at the lead. Uh, we had uh, Jackson, named after my son. Uh, we had Arthur, named after my father. And Bill the Bastard, named after my grandfather. Not yeah. the bastard, the Bill, the Bill bit. <laughs> the, the bastard, he earned himself. <laughs> so uh, that was our four team. They were pretty young camels. They're only about five years old. They're not too big. Um, so What's the we, general age, uh, uh, like life expectancy for a cow? Uh, cows can live up to about 45 years. Wow. Yeah, so cool. out in the wild, probably not too much longer past 25. It's, mm. it's a hard life out there, hard seasons, droughts, a lot of fighting. Yeah. Uh, but in, when they're domesticated, they can live up to, you know, 40-odd years. Cool. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, Get yeah, milked. I've got my boys for a long time. Yeah. You know, that means I've got my boys now until I'm like 70, 75. That's awesome. It's a long-term commitment. So... Yeah, so we get off and uh, finally get the finishing touches on, build up the courage to get rid of the car. So what town did you leave? Uh, so we left from a place called Coonar Beach. Coonar Beach. End, right next to the Elliott River. In North Queensland. Queensland. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And their plan is to head straight across Australia, head straight back towards home. So it's about a four and a half thousand kilometre trip. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit of a rough start, a bit of a rocky start. Uh, but I go, all right, let's... Let's just take off. The first half of the trip will train me for the second half of the trip, right? So we're <laughs> gonna get, we're gonna go through a bit of shit, but uh, I'm not gonna be able to learn everything I need to learn before I take off. We're gonna have to learn a lot of this stuff as we go. So we take off, and within 300 k's, I'm, I'm having a great time. I'm I'm nervous, and it's a little bit nervous, but but I'm having a great time. So I decide to stop heading west. I'm like, this is the first detour. There's, there was a few, but. First detour is like, let's, let's head south. Yeah. Uh, instead of heading towards WA, let's head towards Canberra. I'm going to try and make Canberra for Christmas, see my sisters. So um, that decision was, all right, well, that's going to be about a 2,000-kilometre a detour. So we're going to add 2,000 k's on to do this. All right, well, what's the difference between four and 6,000? You know, fuck it, let's do it. So we literally in one afternoon decided to head to uh, ACT. Jeez. So we, we get down to ACT. Uh, and that takes us April through to about December. So now we've been on the trek for, you know, we close out the first year. 2018? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2019. 2019, okay. Yeah. So uh, we close out the first year and people kept on saying, where are you going after Canberra? I was like, well, I'm just heading south. How far south are you going to go? I said, well, let's see how far south we can get. So that's, that was the mentality when I left Canberra. Let's see how far south we can get. Um, within 70 k's, bushfires just start ravaging the east coast of Australia. There's bushfires everywhere, oh, the whole yes. thing's lit up. And I'm in the, I'm in the uh, high country coming out of Canberra, so I'm trapped in the middle of state forests 
with raging bushfires all around us in a little town called a little place called Brindabella. So um, we've walked in. We've got to walk out. There's no there's no other way out. But you can't outrun a fire. So uh, we decide we're going to bunker down in Brindabella and try and wait this fire out. Um, we thought that the fire was going to come over the top of us. Right. So uh, we'd camped out by the Goodra Digby River and we were running uh, training drills, taking the camels into the water, tying them up in the water. And uh, the local fire brigade had given us a pump and a hose to uh, throw a stream of water up over the top of us to prevent against ember attacks. So we're up for about, I uh, probably slept about five hours and five days because we're waiting for this fire to come through. And we have no idea when it's, when it's going to come. As soon as the wind comes up, gets closer and closer, it gets to within 5Ks of where we're camped, and then the wind changes. All of a sudden the wind starts to push the fire back on itself and they go, you've got a three-day window. If you can walk 100Ks to Tumut in three days, you've got to go, but you've got to load those cables like, like now, start loading now and go. So I'm like, all right, well, we, can, we can do this. It's pretty rocky and up and down. It's 40 plus degree every day and you're covered in smoke and uh, visibility is pretty terrible, but I'm like, well, we can do this. So I've got a fire up my ass. Fucking oath I can do, you know, 100 Ks in three days. So we get out, we start, we start the run, first day is good. Uh, towards the end of the first day, or no, beginning of the second day, uh, one of the volunteer uh, five guys comes by and he goes, oh, mate, you must be hungry, here's a bunch of sandwiches, gives me a heap of beef, cheese and pickle sandwiches. By that afternoon, gastro's got me hard. Oh, no. Uh, the beef was bad. Oh, you know, so old you Mavis up. trying to make her volunteer firefighter sandwiches oh. has just taken me out and also taken out half of the volunteer fire force. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I start throwing up and shit and, and it is, it's just not pretty. Uh, but you've got the fire up the ass. You've got to keep going. So you got two fires up your ass. Yeah. <laughs> 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 up and out. Yeah. So um, we get to uh, the last day and it's, it's a stinker. It's like 44, 45 degrees. I've got 40 odd Ks to do and um, I get, I'm about halfway through that day and I finally get it back out onto a main road and then we're closing in towards Tumut and, and then another attack starts to hit it. So I'm like, I've got a shit and I've got a spew like right now. Oh so I lean up against a tree, I'm holding up against a tree, pants around the angles, throwing my guts out, having a shit and that's when a car goes past. <laughs> and I had no idea what to do, I had a spare hand so I just, I just wave. <laughs> I just, what do you do? If that was you, hit us up. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we close out one of the most difficult days of the trek. Um, I got into Tumut, and one of my favourite photos of the whole entire trip is as I'm uh, approaching the uh, the showgrounds and walking through uh, overhanging trees over the road, and there's a bit of defence force vehicles and stuff in the background. There's a smoky haze, and I'm texting mum saying, hey, I, I made it through to the other side. And the local photographer just happened to snap that moment. And it's like the, the end of the hardest day of probably my whole entire life up until that Fuck. point. Because there was worse days to come. Holy but, shit. Uh, that, was, that was probably the first big challenge that we hit on the, on the my track. My God. So that was after, uh, was after Christmas? Yeah, yeah. So in the early, early January. Yeah. Damn. Because I remember like on the news, it was like, oh, wow, how can it get any worse than this? And... You know, 2019, 2020, what a shit start to 2020, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we thought. Yeah. Like so then said. so then, after you've come out, which state are you in at this point? So we're in New South Wales now. Yeah. 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 And how close to the coast are you? Uh, so if I had gone towards the coast out of Canberra, I wouldn't be here today. So I would have been trapped in between the fire and the ocean uh, and I would have been on logging tracks going through – uh, places that were just completely wiped out. That fire came through really quick. So on a whim, I decided to head out towards Tumut um, before the fires were becoming a thing. Um, had I gone, there was, there was two projected routes I was going to go. Had I gone the other way, I'd, I'd, I'd be dead. There'd, there'd be no way we would have got out of that. And no one would have been able to get in to to get us out. So that was that was a, a good good roll of the dice. So what, what that that moment, take me back to that moment where you're deciding unknowingly going whichever way what made you go to Woomba uh there was the pub was uh, <laughs> closer to it so 
I just had a look. And I was like, "That oh, is right. gold." So the pub it. saved your life. The pub, yeah. It's uh, look. It's it's done a lot of things in negatively to me over uh, times. <laughs> the pub, but you know, it's uh, you know, you earned some credits on that day. That is amazing. But I mean, the, what you have to go through mentally when you're in that space, it's uh, you switch into a different mode. Like on that. Um, uh, when, when I'd left to, to walk and try and outrun this fire, by the second day I'd got my rifle, I'd, I'd filled up the uh, the magazine and I had an extra five bullets in my pocket because I'm like, this fire comes through. You're going to shoot it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shoot all the camels and me. Like, I'm not, I'm not burning alive. We're, I'm not fucking putting us all through that. Fuck. So you mentally, and, and uh, what, what uh, I suppose uh, shocked me after is like how casually I did that. Like, I didn't even think, like, uh, it only hit me afterwards. Mate, you, you fucking put bullets in your gun intended for you and your team. Uh, and and it just seemed like a no, like an okay and normal decision to make. Uh, but, um, yeah, that it, it, the aftermath is sitting down once I kind of escaped the fire. I, I you know, I, I didn't realise the gravity of it until I was out of it. Jesus Christ. You just operate on, you know, like you're on autopilot when yeah. you're in that situation. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Subconscious survival just kind of kicks. Kicks Flight in. or fight, you kind of do both. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm a fence sitter. <laughs> Make a call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's insane. So now you're into February, March 2020. Yeah. Where? Uh, which direction are you going? So I'm heading south with the intention to go straight through the guts of Melbourne. All right? But as we know, February, March 2020, <sighs> things start to change. Oh my God. So COVID starts to hit. Yeah. So uh, I get as far as Mansfield, COVID's starting to kick in. Mansfield's the first time I rocked up to a town and the pub was shut and I'm like, shit, serious. <laughs> like, I can't, I, can't oh, even, I can't even get into a pub. Um, all right, there's no point in going to Melbourne. Um, it's, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> it's the only good thing about Melbourne. It's the only good pubs. thing about it, yeah. That's <laughs> like, if they're shut, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, you don't go there for the lovely weather. So I uh, decided what I was going to do is I'm going to uh, head through the Victorian high country in winter, which is probably not the best time to do it. Um, but uh, disappear into the high country. By the time I get out at the other side, all this COVID stuff, it'll be, be all disappeared, you know? <laughs> it, would have, it would have sorted it all out, you know? So um, I head off up into the Victorian high country to go through a place called Jameson over the top of Mount Skeen, uh, 1600 metre high mountain, and then down the other side through Lacola. Um, so it was about 300 k's of, of high country that I was gonna go through. So we get through Jamison, absolutely beautiful. It was the turn of the season, all the different coloured leaves. It was like you're in this little English country town. Yeah. It was beautiful. And then we head up and start the approach up uh, Mount Skeen. We get uh, only like three or four days into that and a local had told me to take these little uh, bridle trails or goat tracks that kind of weave through the oh, hills. And... I've got a 15 metre long... Uh, two metre wide camel train. So it becomes, and we can't turn around on these tracks, we can't do anything. And and the tracks start to get a bit gnarly. So I made the decision, and bad weather's coming in. So I made the decision, I'm going to camp out, and then the next day, I'm going to walk straight back out the track I just came in on, because this is this is getting too hectic. Um, weather had other, other plans for me. <sighs> All right, over the next 48 hours, we get 190 mils of rain come through the area. So being in the high country, all of a sudden there's waterfalls coming off everywhere. The river starts to rage. The river's coming up and rising. And we're stuck on the side of this now extremely slippery and uh, shitty kind of mountainous country. And camels are soft-footed. They've yeah. got bugger all grip, right? It's like a soft foot that, uh, you know, it'll slide all over the stop. Like uh, my camels turned into like Bambi on ice. You know, they, they, they've got no stability. So I wait for the rain to subside. I've been trapped there for four days now. I'm like, fifth day, we're running out of feed. We've got to get these boys out of here. So we've just got to have a run for it. So we have a run. I, I get about four k's down the track and there's this big uh, lot of water coming over. Like, we can't turn around. We can't stop. We've just got to go. So I push through this little section and I get the first two camels across. All five are attached together. Um, and uh, I hear a noise. I hear one of the camels yell out, uh, and I turn back and I see it's the third camel on the line. The whole entire track's just given away underneath him. Oh. All right, so I've got him dangling out. The two camels in front and the two camels are behind. I kind of hold him in, but he's, he's about to drag the whole entire team down attached together. Do that, I lose all five. 
So I make the split second decision, all right, we've got to cut him out. All right, we'd rather kill one than see all five go. So jump out, just leave the, leave the lead rope, go around the outside of those uh, five camels, get to the third. His lead rope's connecting him to the camel in front and then there's another lead rope that goes from his neck to the camel behind. So I get into both of those ropes, cut them out and bang, both of us are off the side of the cliff. So I fall about 20 metres until I get tangled up in some of the blackberry bushes. And as soon as I stop in those blackberry bushes, then boom, that camel comes and smashes straight through me and just keeps going. So I get hit by this one tonne camel coming down a hill at speed and then I watch him just continue to roll. And I've just seen him go down towards the... Yeah, seeing him go down towards the river, I think like that river's raging and he's got 200 kilos on his back. Like he's... Yeah, you know, like it, I thought it, I thought I killed killed my mate, you know, and and then about ten meters before, he hits a tree and he stops just before the water. Um, so I start getting out of my situation I'm in. Meanwhile, the dog's the only one who voluntarily fucking jumped off. He's licking me on the face oh. and he's jumped off the side. We get down the camel and start just cutting the gear off, just and bugging me, dead, he stands up. I thought his legs would be snapped. I thought I was going to have to put a bullet in this this camel. And, um, but yeah, he, he stands up, he's got a bit of blood, you know, he's scratches and bruise, but he's, and he's yelling, but he, he's, he's all right. What's so the name? That's Arthur. Arthur. Oh, Arthur. no. It's the so dad camel. I was like, I killed dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, we can't walk back up, it's too steep. Uh, he's got a shovel on him. So I start digging these goat tracks into the side of the hill and then just anchoring him tree to tree. So I've only got about two metres of rope, uh, two and a half metres of rope. So we're fighting for each metre. It, we get him to about 10 to 15 metres from the top. Um, and there's some great video that I'll share that you can throw up whilst we're talking about this. <laughs> um, and we get him about 10 metres or a place where I can actually just secure him. So he's, um, uh, he's fine. So I can go and check on the other camels. I can't get him all the way up. It's too steep for the last bit. So I'm like, all right, we'll worry about that later. Let's go see what's happening with these two lots of two camels that are now just roaming, you know, on, on the track with no idea where they are. So I get up, I see my little camel and Bill the Bastard. They're fine. I tie them off against a tree. Can't see the others. Oh, no. I get around the corner. Uh, I see two more camels off the side. So now I've got three camels off the side of this cliff. And so I jump in there. I don't know how long they've been lying over on their side as well. I don't know how long they've been down there. So... Again, get down there, just start cutting, ripping gear off them. It takes me about 40 minutes just to get the camels sitting up again. Um, so they've, they, they've been through a lot, you know. Then, um, that's, I made the decision then, right, I can't get out of this myself. Now I need help, now I need support. So I've got my Garmin in reach navigation. It's got an SOS feature on it. So I hit that. Uh, sends a uh, alert to emergency services, but I can also SMS from this device because they don't generally come out geared for automatically to rescue camels off the side of a cliff, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm able to text and convey my situation to the local CFA, SES and, and police so they can come out with the equipment and win winches and pulleys and stuff that they need to, to help us out. So um, they can't drive in, they obviously have to walk in, so they have to get to within about five k's of where we are and then walk all this recovery gear in. So three hours before they arrive. By that stage, I've got all all the camels close to being recovered. I just, you know, can't pull a 700 kilo animal up that last bit, need, need the recovery equipment. So they bring out like four wheel drive recovery equipment, you know, so to, uh, to try and you know, manually winch them up. Uh, we get them all back up to the top. First thing I'm gonna do is load all the gear back on them. Uh, Cause we've got to walk all this gear out. So by the time we get them all back up, loaded up, now it's pitch black. Oh. So I've got five Ks to do in pitch black with a tiny torch. To get out of that shit area. To get out of that shit area and keep going with the same issues that I've just gone through and I was struggling with in the day. Yeah. And it was kind of funny. We had all those rescue people there and, and uh, they were all helping and I left and they were still abseiling down to recover saddles and gear and, and stuff like that. And they said, you just get the camels out. And, all of a sudden, you know, I went around a couple of bends and I'm like, I'm completely by myself again. You know, like, even though all those people are back there, it was just this moment of like, I'm pitch black on the side of a mountain with a bunch of these camels and a, like alone again. But we, we, we got out. Um, couple of close calls on the way out, but, but we, we kept going through. 
The camels are so good, so forgiving. To be able to be loaded up and immediately go through that again. Uh, yeah, and we, we, we get to the end and uh, back out to where the track is and where all the support vehicles are and... Yeah, that That's was uh, that was the cliff fall incident. It was lucky that Arthur had the the shovel on him. Yeah, lucky. A couple of things. He had the gun. He had the shovel, uh, and he had uh, a bit of spare rope in the inside of his packs. So um, uh, after that, I really looked at you know what each camel has on them, and then it was like, all right, now we have spare rope on every camel. Now we've got a little. You know, <sighs> there's this, a few things that we had on every camel. Every camel's got snacks and a bit of water and. You know, so no matter which camel I'm down the bottom of a cliff with, uh, or wherever I am, uh, you know, I can uh, you know, bunker down with that what it, with supplies out. from that one camel. So now that you're out of it, which state are you in? So we're in Victoria. Yep. Yep. And uh, we're still on. We're not even halfway up this mountain. So <laughs> vet vet comes out the next day to check over the camel, and it turns out the, the saddle bags and, and everything acted like a roll cage. So there was no internal injury. A oh. couple of little cuts, like he. You know, he, he came with a built-in roll case. So he was yeah. fine. We had one day rest and we're straight back into it. So it's about five days later, um, we get towards the top. Uh, we get to the peak of uh, Mount Skiing. So the project sends this camera guy out there to do a live cross about the, about the camel incident, the bizarre camel rescue. Um, do the interview with them. They head off and then we're up on the top of Mount Skiing and he goes, oh, I think there's some bad weather coming. So we've got more bad weather, but now we're on top of the mountain, which is a completely different experience. So now we've got 140 kilometre hour winds and two foot of snow dumped on us in the first night that we're on the top of this mountain. So we're snowed in. We can't go anywhere. <laughs> oh my God. The camels, um, I've, I've created some, uh, some tarps to divert the wind, but I'm having to wake up every hour or two hours and scrape the ice off the camels because they're starting to freeze over. So we get trapped in there. I'm lighting fires around them. We're trying to strap blankets onto them with grunt straps um, uh, just to, to wait out the, the storm until the wind goes. Um, so the wind died down after a couple of days and we're like, we've got to get these camels going. One of them is starting to shiver. And when, when they start to shiver, that's, that's, that's the onset of uh, – uh, you, don't, you don't want to leave that situation uh, uh, too long. So people will get up, we'll load them up, we'll get moving. So we walk out. And we get down to below the snow line and go, we've made it. We're done. So I had the guy who's been doing a bit of a doco with us and another local guy that's out with us. And we're like, we got over. We got over. So we get on it. You know, like we start throwing beers back, yeah. dance around the fire, having a good old time. Wake up with a banging head the next day and <laughs> slept in till about eight or nine o'clock. Uh, over my swag, get out. And I'm like, oh, fuck. The camels have all escaped. I got too drunk. I didn't tie them up. Um, they've busted down the fence that I put Had up. Had enough of your shit. Yeah, they're like, this guy shouldn't be the captain of the ship. <laughs> like, we are out of here. <laughs> um, so uh, th there's no fences for, for ages. Like, this is like millions and millions of hectares of Victorian high country. So I'm running around thinking where the best food is, trying yeah. to figure them out. Five hours, nothing. But they all tied together? No, no. They're oh, just, no. They're just roaming, mate. Shit. So... Um, one of the guys, the local fella, he goes, I'm going to go check out back, you know, in the snow line. We, we, we hadn't thought to go out there because, like... No way. Why would you, why would you yeah. get back up into that shit storm we just got <laughs> out of? And he, he, he calls us pretty straight away and he's like, mate, there's camel prints going the other way in the snow. We found them right back up the top. <laughs> so they'd gone back, mate, ice addicts. They, <laughs> they were straight back for another <laughs> hit. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we head back up to the top of the mountain and... Walk them back down again, and you know, and they were pretty well tied up. Learn your <laughs> but, lesson. Yeah, learn, learn your lesson. lesson. Oh, All you'd right. think so, but uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a, yeah, it's better. I, I've, I've, I've repeated that error again, but yeah. So that was that was our experience. We got through at the end there and made it all the way out to mm. uh, La Cola, and then out to Lake Entrance, and um, so we, we we did we did make it through the other side, but it's probably that that section of. Um, both in this New South Wales and the Victorian high country, uh, yeah, probably presented some of the biggest challenges that yeah, are faced you, on the You did the trip. hot and the cold. Yeah. The cold kind of. Fire and, and ice, mate. Fire and ice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the wet as well. Um, and then the wind. So you've, you've covered all four elements. And we've just, you know, cracked over one year on the trek yeah, by this out. point. So now we're about, um, you know, 14, 15 months into the trek. So what, what date is that uh, at the end of the... We're about June, June at this stage. 2020. 
Yeah. Yeah. June 2020. So. Did you ever get flagged for like not being in lockdown or any bullshit like that? It was, so I was going through uh, Jamison and this cop couple's out there. So this is during Victorian lockdown and, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the cops and you saw all the footage on social media and the cops being heavy handed and this and that. Like, yeah. So that's, that's all playing out. And then you got me and my camels just like strolling down the road and this cop car pulls up. Sergeant Kenny was his name. <laughs> If you're watching. Shout outs. You know, um, and uh, he goes, mate, what are you doing, mate? You're meant, you're meant to be in lockdown, you know? Like, And I said, pretty much am. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't find any pet friendly places to stay, you know? Like, you know, And uh, he just looks around and, and he just says, I can't be fucked with the paperwork and gets back in his car and just leaves. So thank you, Sergeant Kenny. So I hope fun. I didn't get you in the shit, mate. That's classic. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Put masks on all the camels and isolate in the bush or some shit? Well, I, I think you pretty much are. I slid under the radar because I don't think they were expecting that. Oh, you know, you let one camel guy loose and then all the camel guys go loose. So I kind of, I didn't really fit into any rules or categories. So everyone was just like, yeah. By the time they figured out whether you should or shouldn't be doing it, you're gone. You know, I'm moving yeah. five times a week. So. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't staying in one place long enough for it to ever be an issue. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Mm. Well, did you did you even get it? No, the, the maybe thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't check. Um, <laughs> it wasn't really a thing. Like I said, I was I was pretty much set up to self isolate, so I'm just off doing my own my own thing. Yeah. So um, when, you, when you're traveling, by the way, like just a curious question: every day, every night, you had to stop and get the swag out, settle the camels down, tie them up, start a fire every day. Every day. Like it's, a, it's quite a process. I'll run you through like a, a typical day. So um, I'd generally be up. Uh, you're up and down with the sun mainly a lot of the time on the trek. So you're up, a uh, bit of brekkie, start packing all your stuff up. By the time you get to the point where everything's packed up, swag's rolled up and everything like that, and you've had your brekkie, it's an hour into your day. Um, then you've got to start loading up the camels. So you've got to take down the fence, the electric fence that we've got there, and then we've got to um, uh, start loading, brush down the camels, load them all up. That's about another hour. So we're two hours before we take off. You only do it about four to five k's an hour, so you've got about seven, eight to ten hours of walking every day. Um, and then you've got to take all the gear off. There's 1.1 tonne of gear. So uh, that's a tonne on and a tonne off every day. So we moved about 700 times over the whole entire trip. Uh, 750 odd times, uh, which means that we've moved what was that 14,000 ton? Jesus. Yeah, 1,400 ton. 1,400 ton uh, over the course of the trip. So it, 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 the the trip ended up going for three and a half years. So uh, we've kept on heading south. Uh, the detour south is still going. Uh, Victoria's <clears throat> shutting all their pubs, and I'm like, this is a shit hole. Get out of here. <laughs> so I booked a ticket, put me and the boys on a boat. We went to Tassie. Oh, hey. The land of open to... pubs. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So we hired a 40-foot stock crate, put all the camels in there uh, and all the gear. I went on the spirit of Tasmania and into Tassie we go. What month was this? So now we're into September. Oh. Uh, and how long were you in Tasmania for? Mate, it took me six months to walk 1,200 k's. I was going so slow. Every you were, wine, you were I in Tassie at, for six months? Yeah. I, I, I uh, <laughs> stopped at every winery, every oh, distillery. Yes. Um, I was there. I, would, I was in Tasmania when you were there then. Yeah, right. Because I was there for, um, yeah, for, was it? Oh, actually, no, a lie. That was the year after. My bad, my bad. I, I was there September. Did you go to Bruni Island? No, no, it didn't take me out. But there, there were camels on Bruni Island. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so someone had camels out there for a while. Yeah. And we ended up, get, get, we kept in south, we... Waved at Bruni Island on the way past, but we uh, wrapped up at Cockle Creek. So it's the most southern point that camels have ever been in Australia in history, and, uh, maybe even the world, because I don't think they've been to that south southern extent down in South America. So, um, yeah, we got down there on New Year's 2021. Yeah. So now we're like, all right, we've actually got to start heading back to Perth now. <laughs> all right, we, we, we cannot get further away from the original objective. So, yeah. um turn around, start heading back up. So it, it was two and a half years of trekking. So we, now we get up to around Mildura. So it's two and a half years of trekking before we even hit like camel territory or, you know, oh. where, 
where we should so be. So you're yeah, completely in uncharted territories with the crew. Yeah. Far out. So we get to um, uh, we get to Mildura. Now we're going to start doing the desert runs. So I didn't really have too much of a plan. I was just like, let's just start heading out there, chat to locals, and we'll sharpen up a route as we get there. So, yeah, over the next few years, uh, it took me two years to get through, but we got through seven of the ten Australian deserts um, and wound up on the coast of Geraldton about uh, four weeks ago. Four weeks ago? Four weeks ago. Far out. I feel like there's about 100 more hours worth of story between Tasmania and Geraldton. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I skipped past the you know, the last 6,000 Ks. Yeah. I mean, the first 6,000 Ks, that's where, that's where I was cutting my teeth, you know. Or everything went to shit because yeah. I was still learning what I was doing. I had, you know, I was like fish out of water. So that's where all the fun stuff happens. Like you go to a car race, you want to see when someone crashes. Yeah. I crashed a lot when I started. Yeah. So that, that second uh, leg of the trip um, was a lot easier. Yeah, it, it, it presented different challenges, but uh, we, we didn't uh, we didn't have as many. My life wasn't on the line as much. Mm-hmm. It was probably a, a section of the trip that I was worried about the most at the start. You know, like you're so remote when you're going through these places, especially when I was going through the Gibson and Tanami deserts. Uh, the closest human being to me was the International Space Station every time it went over my head, and you're on foot. So, you know, you're nervous about that part of the trek, but... That's where camels come from. That's camel territory. They're they're uh, they're at home out there. They were more yeah. relaxed. Did um, you ever did you ever wish you could like kind of you, you rode the camels uh, at times? No, no, walked walked the whole way. You never rode a, the camel. Never rode them. Twenty six million one hundred and seventeen thousand steps. Twenty six million. <laughs> Would you have your phone counting every step? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get you, you get you get points on the Qantas. Yeah. <laughs> free free points for mm. life. So, so, and I was just thinking, I was like, man, surely this guy's designed a, a rig where you can put yourself on the camel, fall asleep, and it's just like cruise control, autopilot. autopilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah. Nah, like an Outback oh, Tesla. Yeah. No, no, the, <laughs> no, 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 you'd, you'd fall into your zone and five or six hours would just disappear. The walking, it, when I first started training with this guy, Russell Osborne, he's like, mate, the walk's a reward. I'm like, mate, you got fucking rocks in your head. <laughs> walk, walk. This, is, this sounds like the worst part of the trip. Um, and no, it turned out that the walk was the reward, was, both yeah. during mm-hmm. and also it's one of the parts of the trek that I'm really proud of. You know, I've, I've walked through every state in Australia. Like there's, there's l- less than a handful of people that have ever done that, yeah. uh, let alone so slow. I became the second slowest person <laughs> to do a trek, <laughs> trek around Australia on foot. That's uh, – damn. <laughs> Damn, I know, right? Should have spent more time in Tassie drinking uh, wine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So what was the the moment where it all came crashing down where you were like, fuck this? Gotta get out. Yeah, like you weren't sure that you were gonna gonna continue on. Yeah. Did you have Oh on, on the trek, they hit a couple of those walls. Yeah, there, there was a few times. Um that we had to go through a bit of a mental battle in order to justify carrying on. Um there was one section where I spent three days where I didn't even get out of my swag. I just couldn't, couldn't justify, well, why am I doing this? Uh, why can't you get out? And I, I think I was thinking way too big, you know, like um, uh, on a nature of a trip that goes for so long and it's such a big thing to bite off, sometimes it can just suffocate you. Like if you just consider the gravity of it too much, um, uh, I... I try to as much as I could just focus on the next 100 Ks and occasionally, you know, your mind plays tricks and it blows out. So I, I couldn't get out of my swag for three days. So I really just brought things back to that little bite-sized chunks to get out. So I'm going to get out and I'm going to tidy up that one saddlebag. And then when I finish that one saddlebag, oh, let's, let's just do two more. And, you know, eventually all the saddlebags were tidy up. Oh, well, I've tidied up the saddlebags. May as well roll up my swag. All right, well, I've rolled up my swag. I've done all this. We may as well put it all onto the camel. And once it got going, the momentum started to go and you, you, you'd be back on track. But I, I, if I thought about how big this trip was going to be right at the start, I never would have taken the first step. Um, it had to be tell myself it's a 1,000K trip and then tell myself it's, it's okay to go four and then to six and then to, yeah, you know, Like just step by step, yeah. break it down. 
Yeah, action to action. I heard it's like what we call chunky or blocking. Yeah. Uh, I think marathon runners do it. Yeah. Where they, uh, they they just set themselves little blocks within there and, and little rewards that they give themselves along the way. So, yeah, that was that was definitely one of the tools that um, allowed us to be able to, yeah. to, to go for so long. That's definitely the way to do it for sure. When Did you go like across the Nullarbor at all? Did no, no so we bit? went quite north. So we, we uh, got up to Uluru, yeah. uh, went up to Kings Canyon. Did you go over the rock or around it? <laughs> Oh, there, there was a very similar to Uluru looking rock uh, only in the last 500 k's of the trip and it felt like I was going across the top of yeah. – it's, it's the same uh, – what, what kind of rock do they call it? Um, and it's the same kind of makeup of rock yeah. as Uluru. There's a few other ones in Western Australia. So I got to take, take my camels across yeah. the top of a, uh, a, a non-Uluru, yeah. ones that one you're allowed to <laughs> take them across. When you're in the NT, did you go like back up north again to go yeah. across the top? Yep, yep. So I went up as far as Lake Mackay mm-hmm. um, and darted through several Aboriginal communities. So I went through Mount Liebig, Kentor, uh, Kirikurra, Coonawarriji, and then down to Waluna. Any of these places that you've never heard of before as well? Uh no, I, th- I think I'd heard of mo- most of them, yeah. especially being a WA boy. You're, yeah. you, um, yeah, you're yeah, pretty, yeah, you're sure. pretty aware of of the community. Yeah. Around. I hadn't heard of Mount Liebig before, I suppose. Yeah. Or wound up there. Um, I'd never been to the territory before. First yeah. time I went through was was on foot, so um, <laughs> it's a cool way to experience that. So I was learning a lot about it as I was going. I was I was I hadn't been to many of the places on the east coast other than Canberra. Um, I hadn't been to any country towns on the east coast or anything like that so every town uh, it was a new experience every corner i didn't know what was around uh, the side of it so and then did you go to the broom part where you did the across the beach thing no no i decided to uh wrap up in geraldton the, the mayor of geraldton actually he planted the seed i got on the turfs with him and he's like mate you gotta finish this trip in geraldton i'm like fuck Jero. um <laughs> <laughs> but then anyway was, uh, the more i started to go through i, I started to appreciate and love country towns a whole yeah. lot more and and i was like gerald is actually a really good place to finish and a uh, real beautiful ocean there and I, I, call, I called the mayor from my sat phone. I'm like, mate, <laughs> what happens if I finish in your town? He's like, mate, we'll open the pubs in your honour and you can walk down the streets, you can do whatever, you know, like do whatever you want with the camels in the town for the whole weekend. I was like, sold, all right, we'll, we'll finish up in Geraldton. So it was really nice finishing up there. there was like a statue of you with your camel train. Working on it, working <laughs> on it. <laughs> Fuck yeah. So during the three and a half years, how did you go with, uh, with just yourself uh, and uh, no shielders around, just your camels. Yeah, that, that, that was a bit of an adjustment. Uh, there was, <laughs> yeah, there was, if you want to get laid, don't take camels around Australia. It's, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, it was a bit of a drought out there. But yeah, it, it, even human interaction it, it, at all was, mm. you know, at a minimal for the last, the last year or two of the trip. So I did have a, a couple of people join us along the way. So out of the 12,000 Ks, probably had someone with me for about 3,000 of them, whether it was a filmmaker, it was a French girl, that uh, Cammy, that joined us for a while. French girl. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, always got to eat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, no, no, we, we, had, uh, we had a few people join us along the way, but the last half, uh, the last uh, uh, year of the trip uh, was mostly solo. So yeah, cool. I went up to a three-and-a-half-week period where I didn't even see another person and never even... Uh, interacted with anyone so there was those gaps were uh slowly introduced it was like i had one or two days by myself then yeah a little bit later i had three or four days so it would have been hard if it was just bang three and a half weeks yeah Um, so i slowly fed that into the trek you know the east coast it was just town hopping and bar hopping and uh winery hopping and then uh once i started to get closer towards the center the gaps between towns got bigger so i got to wean myself off people yeah which is good so, oh there you go yeah so yeah. like i said the, the parts of the trip that i was worried about concerned about at the start yeah ended up being some of the the nicest parts of the trek yeah so if i find myself uh randomly taking camels across the desert what's my what's your go-to meal for do you recommend for me sustainable camel Camel. Yeah, yeah. What did you like? Just cut out a little bit every no, now. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. So yeah, you've got a bunch of three-legged camels now. Um, no, no. So when you're going through the desert, the uh, one of the uh, biggest concerns you've got is wild bull camel attacks. So you've got these 1.2 ton 
absolute units charging you trying to kill your kill your camels so it's a very competitive space out there uh, for mating and um, the camels out in the wild run in three main different groups you've got your family group which would be the big bull camel his harem of females and a bunch of younger calves and then you've got uh, the younger bulls as they get to a certain age that big bull will kick them out so they don't become a threat so they form a bachelor pack so you've got all these young bulls <laughs> yeah. as well and they'll have sounds big... familiar yeah i know right sounds like <laughs> northbridge <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're just as scrappy and just as gnarly so uh, <laughs> uh there'll be one big dominant bull in there that, that in both of those groups occasionally one will challenge for the leadership yeah one will lose he gets discarded and he becomes a solo rogue bull camel yeah and that guy just wants to fight or fuck so he will <laughs> see a pack doesn't matter whether you've got boys or girls He's coming in to fight for leadership of that group. They're such intensely a herd animal. They want to be Mate. with with a herd, so they will challenge for the leadership so that they can become a part of the herd. They don't want to be out there by themselves. So when they come in, it's like they've got nothing to lose. It's like destined solitude and loneliness for the rest of his life or go in there and fight your way back into a pack. So they come in and they mean business. Yeah, not much different to human culture, is it? No, no or Northbridge culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, we, we had about 60 bull camel attacks as we're going through 60? Yeah. Jesus. And we had to shoot about 40 of them. But, you know, we didn't have to go hunting. It's like the Uber Eats of the <laughs> desert, you know, like, oh, here comes dinner. And uh, <laughs> you line it up, take the back straps out, and the, the dog and I ate like kings. So, um, yeah, you know, like that scene on um, uh, Forrest Gump yeah. where he's like, you know, at – Shrimp sandwich, shrimp oh, yeah, soup, yeah, yeah, shrimp. Yeah. Oh, mate, I can do that with camels, you know, roast camel, <laughs> stew camel. And so if we, even camel like, jerky. Yeah, camel jerky. Even cutting, I uh, tried to do camel bacon. We, uh, we got camels in our wraps during the day, uh, camel meat in the wraps during the day. So. I've, I've never had camel before. Is it like? Is it, uh, it's like beef. Just, just like beef, yeah, yeah. it's just like beef. Amazing, yeah. amazing. <laughs> you, you, you feel like me being westernized but me being from overseas in the mountains of russia i've seen some shit yeah um you know you, you're westernized but you had to you you have you have to yeah you, you know like uh right now they're like oh go out and go shoot something and and then eat it i'm like nah nah i'd rather go to the butcher thanks you you, you know get paid to it but at the s switch of a fucking flick of a switch i would snap a chicken's neck straight up I'm, yeah. I'm having chicken tonight yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing all the like from all your stories so far I'm like man such an incredible thing but I can relate but I'm kind of like fuck, I'm glad I don't have to go through that yeah but man like at any moment just with the 60 well 40 camels you shot yeah um it, like it's good that you obviously ate them as well mm. they didn't die in vain but also you you saved your herd and you yeah. saved yourself you know you got to yeah. defend yourself and it's a, like I had to address on the trip like uh, what do I consider food like yeah. um, uh, prepared to eat whatever whatever kind of moments notice so I've eaten way more roadkill than I'd probably care <laughs> to admit so my, my my test with that was if it's still got its eyes it's good to go you know like <laughs> oh my God. eyes are the first thing to go so did you um, shoot yourself a couple of times from those experiences as well no. No, it was only that beef, cheese, and pickle. Wow! I, I've I've eaten roca preparing he food must have, with dirty he must have hands, been, and yeah, like I've done everything you should not be doing. Drink dodgy water. Like uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't always check the organs of the animals, so I could have been eating dodgy. <laughs> I, I, I ate echidna, uh, bush An turkey, echidna, uh, tree goannas. Echidna was probably the be one of the best tasting meats out, out oh, there. Oh, don't say that. Now the echidnas are going to be extinct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they got toothpicks after as well. But they, it's like a, a sweeter version of pork. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. And it was already dead or did you just find it and kick it? Oh, you know, uh, you know, it was on the side of the road and I was just going into uh, one of the guys, Ted, who I named the cat lead camel after. He's an old camel man, old bushman. He travelled for 25 years with his Aboriginal wife and – um, six camels in a wagon. And I said I'd just passed in the kidnap was when I was going to his house. He's like, go back out there and grab it. So uh, I went back out there and grabbed it. He's like, we're going to have that. And, you know, we're going to put that in the camp oven tonight. He's like, I haven't had a kidnap for ages. So, <laughs> um, yeah, he prepared it by, um, uh, you have to gut it. But there's a little sack. It's uh, under here if you... Uh, accidentally bust through that then the smell of bile and ant goes all, all through the meat oh. so yeah you've got to be really careful there 
um, steamed it, skinned it, uh, and then just treated it like a roast. And it I'd, was I would have completely fucked it up and would have tasted like ants. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got a phone call. Peter, Peter's on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no good. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was already dead, so it wasn't really... Oh, that's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Freshy, you yeah. know? Yeah, um, freshy still had its eyes. Had a bit of roux. Yeah. I had a bit of... You know, did you get any <laughs> koala in there or anything? No, no, no. <laughs> it's well, probably the worst one. Oh, well, because... Yeah, Not the, endangered species, right? No, no. Well, the, um, a lot of the time, uh, these experiences are with the, the locals or the mm. and some of the Aboriginal communities that I went through were really accommodating, you know, but all the kids were running around, the camels loving that. So I'd go out for a hunt with a couple of the boys to take us out. Yeah. Um, and not everyone always had a gun. So, you know, they're like, oh, you got a gun. Jump in the, you know, jump in the car. Let's go for a, yeah. let's go for a hunt. Get some foxes, get some widgeties and yeah. you go for I a got, fish. I got offered cat. Uh, <laughs> oh, right. okay. So yeah, cats uh, uh, around Kintour and some other places that, you know, cats, cats on the menu. Um, it's the only time I declined. Okay. Was, yeah, yeah. I, I ate a lot of other kind yeah. of stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, cats is where I went. I don't know. Yeah, I only had horse meat recently this year. Yeah, first right. time, uh, and it was in Holland, and it was it's a thing there. I yeah, mean, it's yeah, a thing in anyway. France as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and it was like in in the form of the sausage, and you had this placebo effect. You're like, this is going to taste like yeah. so different. And I had it. I was like, oh, that's all right. It's just like beef, is yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't had. I haven't had yeah, all horse I yet. haven't had specific horse steak, but I've had like uh, they in Italy they had the horse like meatballs. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, go on, give yeah. it a go. You know, not really the the, the that per, again westernized, right? <laughs> um, kangaroo's fine. Um, I've had crocodile. That's fine. Yeah, tastes, tastes like kind of more like chicken. Yeah, it's like fishy chicken. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, eel, fucking love eel. Yeah. You ever get a chance to have smoked eel? Oh, yeah. Tastes so good. Yeah. And people are like, you're a weirdo. And I'm like, yeah. No, eel's great. Tr- yeah, eel's great. Taste it. Um, I don't, I definitely can never have dog. Um, uh, cat, nut. Nah. Yeah, dog and cat. I, yeah, I, I'll nah. eat most things. I don't know why. Dog and cat is probably off for me. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, the, the bush tucker out in Australia is... I mean, in some areas on the east coast, it's not too bad. But once you get out of the desert, it, there's a few little treats out there, but it's pretty rough. Like yeah. they got bush coconuts, which are, taste like a eucalypti kind of coconut kind of thing, and the, the flesh on the inside of a, 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 a I think it's a larvae shell that that grows on uh, the bloodwood tree. Yeah, um, it's okay. You got your yams. Uh, oh, there's some um, seed pods that come off the one of the yeah. acacia trees, but it. It's all like, all right, I could eat that. That's was, the thing, but it's not like, yeah. you know, it's not going to be served up in a restaurant anywhere here in <laughs> yeah. Perth. Like, you know, Australia's got a stuff where you can go, you can eat it to survive, but uh, it's, it's Was not. there a time where you didn't have that much food left and you are like, oh, No, nah, it's pretty good, pretty good the whole oh, okay. way along. Sure. I always had pla- plan Bs, but I always uh, I ended up with food left over because I would always try and lean into the experience of, yeah. you know, w- what's available around. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had my plan B, you know, <laughs> always just tucked away in the back pocket. Yeah. Uh, and that meant that if a, one of the camels got injured, I got injured or whatever, I was in no time pressure in order to have to push forward to a yep. schedule. I could sit there for a week, two weeks until that injury had healed or yeah, whatever. Any, um, any like, uh, close calls with cars or anything? Yeah, with the camels? Well, yeah so we had, a, we had a couple. We, had, we, we were going through Tassie coming out of a, a place called Bishano. And um, we're going down the side of this highway. Guy with a boat, he, he got so close to the camel train um, that the camel kicks the boat. Uh, like the, He's got the car on the boat, kicks the boat on the way past. Like That's how close he got. Just I don't know whether he didn't see us or whatever, but anyway. Um, uh, one, <laughs> one car, another one in Tassie, um, a peep later in a Commodore, and Classic. he comes screaming up behind us. Slams on the brakes, locks it up, he sideways, just misses the back of our camel train, stops, and then he goes around. A shitty nod about 10, 15 minutes later, uh, we get up, we come around the corner, he's spun out and he's off. He's off the side of the road in the <laughs> ditch. <laughs> Instant karma. Yes. Did was, you let him know about it? Oh, it was like, oh, yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, it was a slippery road. I swear, oh, mate, we, I know exactly what you were doing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, was, that was pretty good to see that. Um, but the, the, the gnarliest, closest incident we had with traffic was probably the first incident we had on the trek 
So we're coming down the highway in, in uh, Queensland and I'm following the service road for the railway instead of walking on the highway because there's a lot of road trains. We get up to this section where there's a dog leg of highway over the railway tracks. Um, so I've got the option to either go up over that dog leg with two blind corners with a bunch of semi, semi trailers and road trains going up and down it or go underneath the bridge uh, on the railway line. And so I'm like, I haven't seen a train all day, so. Oh, shit. Yeah, well, that, that's the safer option, I'm right? S- oh, fuck. So it, what there is is there's like the tunnely bit and then uh, there's um, uh, like the, the side of the road, the, the dirt's like ramped up either side. So you've got the railway track, a little, a little groove either side, and then the walls yeah. that go up. That goes on for about another 500 metres. So all up's probably about 750 metres, which for me would be about a 10 minute crossing. So I'm like, all right, let's get on the track. So I did the whole put my ear down on the track, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there's nothing coming. So, <laughs> you know. Does that actually solid. work? I don't, I don't know. Clearly <laughs> not. Because <laughs> after I get through this tunnel and I'm, I'm in that second bit, uh, the 4 p.m. Sydney to Brisbane. So oh, shit. Because it's a passenger train. It's flying, right? Oh, fuck. So he's on the horn, and I'm like, oh, shit, what do I do? So if I really pull my camels and try and get them to do anything quickly, they'll resist, they'll pull back. So... I have to slowly take my whole camel train off and try and get them all. In the little, yeah. Little, yeah. Uh, very lucky because the camels can see the train coming towards us. If they could hear it behind but couldn't see it, they'd it'd be in all sorts, but they can, they can see it. I've got it, no shit, that much gap between the side of my saddlebags and this train as it rockets through. I get them off, 10 seconds later the train comes through that much distance. If one of my camels just steps out sideways just a little bit, boom, we're all gone. My heart is just like, whew. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, we keep walking. I've got to be on that train line as well for the next week. So like, uh, I'm not, not as close to it, but I, I start to develop this relationship with the train driver. So a bit of a rocky start. He's on the horn like, fucking it. Right, but by day three, he's, he's out with his phone taking photos. <laughs> like, hey, mate, flashing his lights for a different reason. He so, added you on LinkedIn yet? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that was that was probably the first, that's probably the most gnarly, closest call that we had with with traffic. But I, I reckon we had three, no, no, probably, probably five odd dickheads on the road out of the hundreds of thousands of cars and trucks and everything that passed us. Oh, that's all right. Like, amazing. Yeah. Like, um, Percentage wise, that's that's sensational. I yeah. had a really good experience on the roads that Australia, uh, my pe- my faith in humanity is peaking. <laughs> yeah. right Everyone was so nice. People were stopping, throwing beers out at us. Um, in Tassie, there was a lot of joints thrown at us. They just see me and just go, bearded hippie, yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll love a smoke. <laughs> Um, in, like uh, in Queensland, everyone had an angle on the back of their car, so a cold six pack would get thrown out all the time to you. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, Aussies are great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you finish in Geraldton. You're now back in Perth. Where are your camels? They're up in Geraldton still. Yep. Uh, looking at some places. Actually, it's the same function we met at. Yeah. Met another little girl who's got 800 acres in the Chittering Valley. So perfect. It looks like they'll be going there. So um, I uh, will bring them down on the 22nd of this month. Once they're close enough to Perth, so I can go up and see them. Oh mate, weekend. I'm keen to go meet the meet the boys. Oh, you got to come out. You got to yeah, come out and meet the boys. Absolutely, absolutely, make a make a thing of it. So, how have you uh, adapted back into civilization with uh, the basic folk? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, with the mouth breathers. <laughs> um, no, no, it's it's been interesting. You can see, I, I've I've donned the suit back on and just kept the hat. Yeah, uh, but um, you know, interesting, like. Uh, it's been as much of an adjustment coming out of it as there was going into it. The things that I was most concerned about or nervous about at the start of the camel trek uh, ended up becoming my comforts that I was really weary of letting go of. Um, uh, weary of letting go of my alone time. Of um, You were institutionalised like a prisoner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. a weird way. Yeah, yeah. That's cool though. So uh, I, I left my life in Perth whilst I really loved it. You know, so I was not worried about, it's not that I was worried about coming back to that. I think it was, I also left the trek whilst I loved it. Oh, yeah. You know, which is a good thing, but it means I've just left something I love. Yeah. I enjoyed it right up until the last day of it. I was at tears in my eyes on the last day because I just knew this, this this part of my life was over and I really enjoyed it. In, in ultimate seek discomfort. 
Mm. Like the yes theory, yeah, you shit on the yes theory right now. Mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, what was the like maybe the top takeaway from the trip that you found out about yourself that you've discovered? Yeah, I, I've been I've been pretty wary about dispensing any advice on uh, <laughs> on what I've learned about myself or uh, takeaways from the trek just yet because it's like I feel like a university student that's just come out of uni and got yeah. his first job i don't really know where all that thought and knowledge really applies because i haven't road tested it i haven't even soundboarded it with by catching up with people like yourself for yeah. a few beers and back and forth a little bit so i get after you know three to six months i'll yeah. start to see what actually applies what what actually fits into you know real life it's a you know i walked into one house right and there was a sign on on the wall that said you know life is short lick the bowl and you know, I'm pretty sure they should have hung that in the kitchen, not the toilet. Right? If you apply the wrong advice into the wrong fucking yeah. area, you end <laughs> up so eating true. shit, right? So yeah, you, well, you ate the bowl completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and shut it out and ate it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fucked. Um, so, <laughs> what's something you don't miss from the trip? Like, you, you go oh, loading fuck and unloading. That shit. Fuck yeah. that. That's <laughs> fucked. Like that. Yeah. It. it I suppose I switched to consider it like like uh, it's just like me going to the gym. I'm just lifting weights. All right? yeah. But for the first two and a half years, it was probably only the last few months where I'm like, all right, lean into it. But I hated it for two and a half years. Yeah. Which is what, and that's the first thing you've got to do to get your day going. Yeah. It's like you have to push through that shitty part. You know, unloading fine because you're in a new spot. It's exciting. You're setting something up. Yeah. All right, but yeah. yeah. And packing I, your shit away and and I and shit the missus. I shit the missus for not making. I, I'm not making the bed. Yeah. She, she shits on me for yeah. that. She hates me for that. Yeah. The only thing she hates about me is I don't make the bed because no, no, I'm sure there's other things. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I get up and I'm just like, I, this, it doesn't add to the productivity of my day. Yeah. yeah. You you have an accomplish. You yeah. accomplish it. Yeah. But yeah, for oh, me, on I'm the like, exact same. Like, like what? Like, I don't see the point in it. And, yeah. You know, I'm not one of these people that put 749 pillows on my bed you know, <laughs> like, for looking at, right? And 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 you have to switch on the trek. Like your swag has to be packed away, and your bed's got to be done. Yeah, you need to take that day. with you. You don't have to. It's got to be packed up yeah, all yeah. the fucking time. Like, yeah. um, and that was not a strong point that I had before. Like, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't the neatest and tidiest of uh, of people. Like, because I'm just like, oh, just get someone else to do that. There is no someone else on the camel trek. It's like yeah. you do it or it doesn't get done and you don't move. Yeah. So it sucked. I know you I know you <laughs> mentioned that you're still kind of really figuring out how it's kind of changed your life mm. um, as well and what you've learned. But now that you're back into the career that you've left behind, um, are you back in working for someone else or have you positioned yourself back into your own business or what? Yeah, so uh, whilst I left, um, the company actually grew. It's nearly doubled in size since I since I left it. Blessing. It's great. So they've filled out the office or just about to fill out the office they're currently in. So we've got to start, you know, planning. So it's still your thing? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I still own 100% of Elliott Insurance. Sick. So, uh, yeah, they need need a new new home to go into. So uh, that will probably be the next project that I'll take on and get yeah. a new office. Maybe do a bit of a co-working space as well. We've discussed that a little bit as well. Uh, but I think I, I really like that. Uh, I, like I said, I left the job whilst I loved it. I don't think I'd step back into that CEO role. But I do love helping people with business. I do love uh, that that process, the um, testing to see if something works, see if something's viable. So creating a co-working space with people in there just having a shot, I think yeah. uh, would be a, a cool project to take on. So maybe I'll get a whole lot more office space than what I need for, for my company and try and create that community. I'm keen to see how that will, will work and, and, and I see it flourishing really well. But I think uh, I'm excited to hear... Uh, your your first story about how someone goes, mate, it's just not working for me. Like, fuck, I had to do this this morning. Yeah. And then you just get this flashback of the last three and a half years of doing something that's 20 times as hard. How do yeah. you think you're going to relate to people? Yeah, I, I, I went to an event and uh, it was good to see a few people, but I saw some of the stuff that people were yeah, complaining about. And after you've had such a big perspective thing, you're like, how are you worrying or complaining about this? But everything has perspective. Uh, uh, you know, they could be feeling that just as hard as some of the hardest moments of my trek. 
I may not see it as that, but for them, if they're feeling it, that it's a lived and real experience for them and it's just as hard for them to navigate and get through. Yeah. I think the, the tool kits that I learned on the trek uh, hopefully will apply to someone to be able to navigate through that issue. And I think I've got to stop thinking about everything being a competitive or comparative state. Yes. I've got to switch back out of that. So um, because it's very hard to plug my experience you know, comparatively into <laughs> you got to be empathetic. everyday life. You got yeah. you show, show that empathy. To but the, the toolkit has value. Yeah. So um, uh, hopefully, um, you know, sharing the stories and sharing some of the things people will be able to extract from from my experience some of the toolkits in order to navigate through some of the, the the complexities of everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm keen to see how that unfolds, and I reckon that will really help your career or wherever you may be going in whichever direction are you planning on eventually down the horizon doing something else extraordinary like this um, i'm going to leave the dance card pretty open all right because yeah. who knows what doors will open we've got the book coming out middle of next year um we've got 14 terabytes of footage uh, oh, that the documentary crew has done so sick who knows what we're going to do with that? So yeah. we're we're exploring some options with that as well. So you know, never know. But that could go on a streaming service, or we could just release something. You know, they, they just do it for the hell of doing it. So okay. no no idea what's going to happen there, and therefore no idea what doors could open up or slam straight in my face. Yeah. <laughs> so it's weird, like with with what you've done, and there's a spot for your book signed copy on that shelf. Yeah, so yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, no dramas. Um, when you rocked up, I mean, I didn't hear about you. Never heard of of you until I met you that day. And um, how? Why do you think that is? Like, what's? Because I because I've told a lot of people. I'm like, hey, yeah. I'm meeting John um, John Camelman, and they're like, who's that? Yeah. Like literally all of them were yeah. like, who's that? Well, I, I suppose I in, in business, I was all about pushing my message out there. We want to get our product, we want to get our services out there. So I spent 10, 15 years shoving whatever I had to offer down people's throats, you know, and or attempting to at least. So when I started this experience, I'm like, I just want to do it and see who notices, all right? Just see, do it and see who gives a shit. So there wasn't, you know, any press or PR or anything in relation to it. And I had nothing to sell, you know, like... Um, I, I, uh, up until whilst, whilst I was on the trek, I never mentioned my company name. So even if I was on the news or they're doing an article, no plugs. I, no, I just say I'm in financial services. You know, they want to investigate that further. That's up to them. But I, I, I didn't want to have anything to sell or anything to plug because there's a freedom in that. Like uh, then I can be whoever. I can say shit, fuck, cunt, whatever, whatever, <laughs> yeah. whatever I want yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I've got nothing to sell. Yeah. I've got, so that doesn't you know you can bleep that out. Um, no, nah. <laughs> it's cool. But um, it, that was that was that was nice. There was like the all the the uh, all the Johns that previously had to exist, like the personal John, the CEO John, the um, John for your friends and the John for your clients. Um, it, there's a lot of similarities between across all those Johns, but you know each each one hides a little bit of you. And all of a sudden, you know, over the last few years, I've got to amalgamate all of those yes. into just one. Yes. And be okay with the ramifications of whatever because I'm not, I'm not asking you to buy anything from me. I'm not asking anything from you. I'm just doing my thing, you know, um, and I'm happy to share the story about it. Did you have to put on the CEO hat at all during the trip for your company? No. Never? No. They, they kept the – Just kept before I started, uh, we had a guy running the place. He was doing a bit of a – he was farming it. He was doing a shit house job. So I, I, I flew back, uh, sacked him, uh, <laughs> uh, put in place the four longest serving employees that I have uh, as a four-way management team, and they nailed it from day dot. So that's why my company grew. I had um, a lot of trust with these guys, um, and, uh, yeah, they absolutely smashed it out of the park. So um, because of those four people, I did not have to put the hat on at all. Four people? Fuck. I checked a few reports um every few months every few months that's it and uh, you were just like yeah it looks good yeah, yeah it's yeah. growing yeah there's, there's on not the too much red <laughs> <laughs> carry on even in COVID, it, it grew without you and you just it's yeah and that's something that like talk about another time but yeah it's just the 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 power of finding the right people 100%. that you trust that, that 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 are invested with with what you're doing 
um, it's key and that goes along into uh, trusting the camels and, yeah. and then trusting in you. Obviously, they don't have that emotional intelligence but you're training with them, you're bonding with them and over time you know how they're – all you, you know them back to front, yeah. all their mannerisms and things, um, the ones that are a bit more clumsy and yeah. the ones that are – Heavier, which ones are heavier? <laughs> oh, they've all got their, their different yeah. personalities. So when, you, when you're trading a wild camel, mm. um, the methods are all exactly the same, right? So because the, you, you're dealing with the wild instinct of the animal. Yeah. Uh, but um, so, yeah, you'll use the exact same methods and you'll pretty much 99% of the time get the exact same response. But as you uh, train them through to reduce those natural wild instincts, they start to go down and the individual personality of the animal comes up. So even though you might train them all initially the same, you will handle them all slightly differently yeah. once you understand the personality. Now translate that to your business, your oh, company. Just, yeah, they, you, you're not really allowed to put nose lines in them, cut their <laughs> testicles out and you know <laughs> run them around the yard until they start obeying you. So again, I'm not sure what I've learned on the camel trek and how that applies <laughs> yeah, yeah, to... Yeah. <laughs> So, but the I'm seeing I'm seeing some similarities, yeah, yeah. without the physical shit, <laughs> yeah. But um, like it's it's cool how like that's how I see it unfolding, yeah. Um, and it would be cool to, to to do a follow up twelve months from now to see if you know it's already started to happen. So being involved in a couple of management meetings and mm. going through some scenarios and, and and you're like, all right, there's 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 something now I can take this bit of knowledge from over here and I can plug it in there yeah. and, and it does work and I've said it in front of people and no one, you know, was like, oh. <laughs> Here he like, is talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's carrying on yeah, again. he's lost it. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, I'm, I'm starting to make those connections and those links. Yep. Um, yeah, looking forward to it, like I said, in six months being able to go, hey, this one yeah, does. absolutely. Link. What about the contrast between the staff and how they talk to you before you left versus – now, since you've come back. So my, my key management kind of team there, we've been in contact over a few years, but um, there were several staff members I'd never met in nature of a growing company whilst you're away. Um, it, yeah, it's a little bit different. When I left, I was kind of on the tools and now I'm kind of not. So uh, it is a strange kind of uh, feeling going back into the office, but I don't, I don't have much to do. And the management team wouldn't even give me access to the invoicing system. They're like, I said, why not? And they're like, you might invoice something. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they really, they they are they, they have taken it on as their own, uh, you know, and, and taken ownership of it. So, yeah, I'm still finding my feet and yeah. what my relationship or interaction with the staff is, is going to be like. Yeah. So I'm trying not to force it. I'm just trying to sit back and see where I'm needed um, and try and read the cues Um and be okay with how that comes out. Very, very similar to your journey. Yeah, 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 very much so. So you, um, when we when we first spoke, you mentioned you were homeless. Yeah, still, still. Yeah. So when you left, you, was it like you put it up for rent, your house for rent, or something? Or everything just you... went into a storage shed. Everything else was gone. So cars, this, that, that everything just got rid of. It, absolutely everything. Wow. So I, I kept stuff that meant something to me. Yeah. Um, so you didn't even like have a house that so you just rented out. No, just everything gone. So, so there was no like contingency plan just in case you pushed out or whatever. No, I backed myself into the That's corner. Fun. Yeah, I love, so, that. I love uh, that shit. Yeah. This is why we're talking right yeah, now. So, uh, oh. I, I think uh, the same reason I had all the camels really loaded up. So there, there was never the option to ride, right? Yeah. To ride, I would have had to get rid of stuff. Yeah. So shit. the last thing I need, like, I, I didn't want to give myself a way out. Mm. that's why I got rid of everything that's why I committed to it then and that's why I loaded the camels up so you have True. to walk there is yeah. not the option to do anything else yeah excellent back oh, yourself mate. in a corner and see what happens absolutely back yourself in a corner and see what happens that's bite, bite off more you can chew and chew like fuck I fight <laughs> I, I, I vibe with that well I've pretty much covered everything that I wanted to cover and and some um, this is a uh, extra long episode. Normally, it just goes for an hour, and I'm just like, I'm just gonna let him talk. How, how long are we going? Uh, I think 20 minutes over. Yeah, right. All right. But oh, mate, the the value in that for anybody who's thinking of taking a leap, you know, taking a punt in, in themselves, I reckon that's where the value will be. Because because yeah. for people, it's a good story, great story. Thank you. I'm keen to see how it goes further, and uh, you know, being a uh, being a man of uh, like a very successful business and just going, nah, I'm going to go do that. And uh, coming back 
uh, with a lot of stories and, you know, maybe you, you seem, you seem like th- there's not many emotional scars. Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, now that you're back, those stories will unfold, like you said, and, um, I'm just keen to just re-listen to it again and again and again. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah, well, I, I suppose the advantage of going through those deserts towards the end, I had a lot of processing time mm. to just be okay with all the events of the trip and, yeah. and really break it down and process it. So um, there's no escaping your own thoughts and your own, you can't escape yourself yeah. uh, with, with that amount of solitude. So you certain things are brought to the table and they have to be addressed. Yeah. So uh, I got plenty of chance to do that, which was a great uh, – great way to kind of to wind wind down and mm. really unpack the the whole the whole adventure um and i was re- pretty remote right up until the last day or two of the trek so we, we were going through the back of station country so I, I second last night third last night i'm still camped out in the station by myself so um yeah it was i got to have that solitude right up to the end which is yeah. great excellent so uh now that you're back again and you're still homeless. You're looking. You're in the property market yet, or uh... no? I just booked trips to Bali today, hey. so uh, we'll, get, we'll get back on the road. Um, I've got my son coming across from the UK, which I'm Excellent. excited about. So I get to spend some father son time with him. See if we can get that accent out of him. <laughs> and um, <laughs> nice kid, terrible accent. Um, so uh, spend some time, go for some father son adventures, show him some of the places I went through, um, and uh, yeah, a bit of fam- family and friend times. Uh, so uh, all the adventures and things that I'm, I'm planning and doing at the moment, all the mini kind of little things, is all about doing it with, you know, the people that I, I care about and trust. That's, I, I didn't miss Perth. I'm, I'm, I miss the, pe- I miss I miss the, the people. people. Yeah, I love it. Love mm. it. Well, thanks for coming in, John. Mate, thanks thank for you for inviting me. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Um, everybody listening at home, uh, John, yeah, John Elliott, look him up. And uh, we're going to open up the, uh, the comments on Spotify that you can uh, drop in a question. And, um, we'll get him to look at it or forward him some interesting bangers. And, uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed the show. I'm, I'm going to be thinking about all those stories uh, later on. And um, I'm going to be sharing some of the snippets from his trip. So thanks for sharing those. Um, and uh, everybody else at home, uh, I hope you got a lot of value out of that. Uh, journey and overcoming all these different things in the trip and finding yourself and being at peace with yourself and just taking a leap just taking a punt I love it 